Welcome back to PCW, where today we're reviewing Monday Night Raw. Stay tuned for information on Charlotte's push and reported injury, why we suddenly have tag divisions on both brands, and the future of The Fiend. Hello everyone, I'm Tom Collihue. You can find me at Collihue, C-O-L-O-H-U-E on Twitter, or Tom Collihue on Twitch. Today we're going to talk about Monday Night Raw, which was a very strange show involving lots more tomatoes, some really confusing moments, some feuds that have really outlived their usefulness, but also a bit of new, bit of fresh and bit of exciting things as well. Be sure to hit like before we get started, comment your thoughts on Raw and subscribe if you haven't. Raw this week was built around a match between Bobby Lashley and Braun Strowman, that would be our main event, but every 20 minutes or so we'd go to something backstage that built towards it. The matches were high quality, even if the match lengths were quite short, and for once we actually had some decent time on a three hour show for the women. There was one big surprise appearance as well, which we'll get to in just a moment. We open with the return of AJ Styles and Omos. Omos now has a taped up and bandaged hand, suggesting that it was him who was injured and had to be cleared, and that's why they haven't been appearing. I did speak about this at length on my Twitch last week for anyone interested in getting the latest news as it comes in. In a WrestleMania rematch, Styles and Amos defended the Raw Tag Team Championships against The New Day. This was very similar to the match at WrestleMania, however Amos was a bit more involved and it was Styles who got the finish. The New Day, as expected, simply unable to deal with the big guy and ended up losing in a very short order. Amos right now is getting the push that Braun Strowman used to get because Braun Strowman right now is being challenged to cut more promos and do a bit more selling. You can see him doing that throughout the show. Since WrestleMania ended, and in fact slightly before on the SmackDown side, Vince McMahon has decided we need to see more tag team competitors. The main reason for that is not necessarily to uh, push the tag team division, but to have more singles wrestlers involved. But pairing people up into tag teams gets them both on TV at the same time, meaning that they don't have to have single storylines. It's just a way of getting more people on screen at once without seriously impacting the storytelling. A vignette aired of Eva Marie, for the upcoming Eva-lution, standing on a car. I always love how these vignettes are so key and really niche down on wrestling. Nah, she just stood on a car. Elias and Jackson Riker decided to get some revenge on the New Day by throwing some tomatoes at them, but ended up throwing tomatoes at Randy Orton. This, as you might expect, would end up in a match. This is also the first time Riddle and his antics on the scooter has actually made me laugh, because as Randy is there seething Riddle just goes by and says, hi, Randy, and I, I, I popped. It got me. It got me. First time for everything. Charlotte beat up Dana Brooke and then was added to the Raw Women's Championship matchup for the upcoming WrestleMania backlash between Rhea Ripley and Asuka. Rhea Ripley and Asuka weren't happy with this, but also they were kind of happy with this. It was a bit mixed when it came to their promos. I'd still very much like to know what's going on with Sonya Deville and Adam Pearce, but Charlotte being added to this match is key to try and draw in the attention that they require. Charlotte is a recognised draw, probably the second strongest draw of the women's division after Becky Lynch, but Becky Lynch of course is unavailable at the moment, and Ronda Rousey, who would be a strong draw herself, is not under contract right now. There was a report saying that Charlotte Flair would be out of action for a little while because of dental surgery, that doesn't seem to have happened. Backstage, Sonya Deville argued of Adam Pearce, meanwhile Lilith, the little doll that Alexa Bliss is carrying around, hovered in the background watching Sonya Deville. Later on, Alexa Bliss in her promo in the third hour would state that Lilith likes the colour red and would like to see some people bleed. Sonya Deville was wearing a red suit this week, but there were also a number of other people in the women's division wearing much the same. It's raw, you're gonna see a lot of red. Sheamus beat the hell out of Humberto Carrillo again, but later on Sheamus would run into Mansoor, who is of course undefeated, and had just signed with Monday Night Raw full-time. Very interesting and very telling about the upcoming Saudi Arabia show that will be happening later on in this year. Sheamus challenged Mansoor to a United States Championship match. That did happen slightly later on, but I'll cover it now. Sheamus had that match with Mansoor, beat him up, threw him to the outside several times. Mansoor managed a few drop kicks, a couple of good moves, a tornado DDT that looked very nice, before Humberto Carrillo charged in, attacked Sheamus, got bro kicked, and Sheamus beat up both of them. This, by the way, is Mansoor's first loss via DQ in his Raw debut. Not a great moment for anyone. In a much more high-tempo match than usual, Damian Priest beat the hell out of John Morrison, got a nice clean win, and that was very much that. 
Near the end of the second hour, we had sort of a lower card segment that seemed like a little bit of a dead zone. I would imagine they lost some viewership here. The Lucha House Party beat up Cedric Alexander and Shelton Benjamin, resulting in a breakup between Cedric and Shelton. Cedric is blaming Shelton for the losses that they've had recently. Shelton then said that Cedric Alexander only came into the Hurt Business because of Shelton, which is rewriting of history. MVP was interested in Cedric long before Shelton actually joined the Hurt Business. I worry that this is going nowhere. I worry, as is typical with WWE, that every time a tag team breaks up, both men, or women, as is the case recently, end up being released in short order. Hopefully that's not the case, but we'll have to wait and see. We also had Angel Garza shove a rose at Drew Gulak's arse in a two minute match which Garza won, and then give him a punt to the butt cheeks. Gotta call it a putt. It was awkward. But hey, at least they're on TV. Our third hour draw segment was helmed by Matt Riddle and Randy Orton's RK Bro beating up Elias and Jackson Riker. It was a very short match and most notable for Adnan Verk having no idea what to do when Randy Orton was throwing Elias onto a table. That was a funny moment for me. The two continue to work well together, but there are definitely some awkward moments ahead. It's interesting that these two are being built towards AJ Styles and Amos, when I think it's pretty clear as well that the Viking Raiders are heading that way too. The Viking Raiders did not wrestle this week, but did have a backstage segment with Matt Riddle, where Ivar got called quite sexy. We had a women's tag team championship match that lasted two minutes. Naomi and Lana got another shot and lost another shot. Can we please move on now? Finally, in our main event, which interestingly did not feature Retribution, who have been featured strongly for the last two weeks, Bobby Lashley defeated Braun Strowman because of the essential distraction of Drew McIntyre. Afterwards, Drew McIntyre hit some claymores and stood tall. This is incredibly reminiscent of the build to the WrestleMania main event between Roman Reigns, Daniel Bryan and Edge, where in the three weeks before the event, First Edge stood tall, then Daniel Bryan stood tall, then the champion Roman Reigns stood tall. Right now we've had Braun Strowman stand tall last week, Drew McIntyre stood tall this week, and in the go-home show next week, Bobby Lashley, the champion, will undoubtedly stand tall. WWE, unfortunately, when it comes to Raw, are being extremely repetitive right now. WrestleMania Backlash looks like it's going to be a couple more people added, sure, but a lot of the same, and we're not too far off getting the same thing on SmackDown. Raw was okay this week, I would call it an improvement on last week, there's a bit more that's actually interesting going on, but I still wouldn't necessarily recommend it if you're a lapsed fan. W my worry really is that we're going to get to a point where it's actually just on the cusp of being good, and then they're going to do this thing that Raw always ends up doing, where they do a show so bad that they set themselves back into the absolute stone age of quality. I am interested in what's happening between Sonya Deville and Charlotte, there is definitely something interesting there. RK Bro has been moderately entertaining so far, and honestly, I like Braun Strowman in this main event picture, even though he won't be there for very long. The big telling things for me though is certain people missing. The obvious one is The Fiend, who in total in 2021, we've seen for about three weeks. That's it. Three weeks in five months, or at least four and a bit months now, is not a lot, really not a lot. And for me, when it comes to his future, I think he will be the one trading with Daniel Bryan. Randy Orton did say very clearly, as long as Randy Orton is on Raw, we will not see The Fiend. Well, Randy Orton has a tag team now. So my suspicion is very much that The Fiend will be moving to SmackDown again to present some new challenges for your Roman Reigns's, your Big E's, and your Kevin Owens's. I've been Tom Collihue, let me know what you thought of Raw down in the comments, and I will see you next time.